Welcome to this week's edition of the Baylo Report. And it's the first program of the month of December, so we have a report to the people with Jim Beer, who is the chairman of the Elmston County Board of Commissioners, Randy Saver, who's president of the Rochester City Council, and Kathleen Harrington, who is president of the Rochester Area Chamber of Commerce. And we welcome you. And there's so much news this time. <laughs> Let's first start out with a low-key question, and that is, what was the biggest accomplishment in the month of November? And Jim, we'll start with you. Oh, start with me. Well, we went through, uh, we've been working on our budgets, and uh, we've pretty well finalized the budgets. We're uh, going to have our Truth and Taxation meeting this Thursday at 7 o'clock at, uh, at the Government Center. So if you want to come down and have a talk with your county commissioners and tell us what you think about our budget, uh, your time is this Thursday. I think it's uh, December 7th? No. No, no. Uh, the 6th. The 5th uh, at it's 7 o'clock. It starts at 7 o'clock. So got my days a little mixed up. Sorry. <laughs> I've been gone for a couple of months. so I know. And Randy Staver, November. Well, I, I would echo that. We put the finishing touches on our budget. We did have our truth and taxation hearing last evening at the Monday uh, council meeting, and, uh, and it was adopted. We're, we're talking about a combined budget, our operational and capital improvement budget of about $383 million. Uh, the tax levy uh, will be in the neighborhood of 6%. Uh, so that was all adopted unanimously last evening by the council. So that's what we will be looking forward to in, in 2020. What was the reaction? Because it's like a hundred million more than last year, right? Well, there's some things that come into that in terms of the projects. Um, uh, so it, it, there's rationale for that and, and why it changed. But uh, many of the funds move around. But again, the, the property tax levy, would, we stuck that at uh, the 6% range. Now, what, what people need to remember is that that doesn't mean that their, their property tax statement that it would necessarily go up or down, uh, that they shouldn't use the 6% figure, because what is also factored in is property valuation. So my personal income uh, property tax, for example, it's going to go up 9% next year. Uh, but the market value of the homestead changed. So uh, people should look for their property tax, uh, proposed property tax statement, and that, that will tell them more accurately what, what will happen in 2020. Okay. Kathleen, I imagine you were presenting the Chamber of Commerce. You were there last night at the council meeting. And uh, what was your reaction? Well, um, Contrary to what people think, the Chamber of Commerce, and I did on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, spoke some gratitude, and gratitude for process improvement um, in the budget process. I think it was much more transparent, and it's the beginning of a journey to increase that transparency and get to more engagement. We felt, on behalf of our members, that we had more opportunity to have conversations with our elected officials and the county administrators on the budget, and we appreciated that. We certainly don't agree with every decision that was made. Um, that would not be um, oftentimes happening in democracy, but we appreciate the process improvements, and we also appreciate the ability that the council and the administration is providing in looking ahead looking out five years. I mean, that's, that's common in state budgets and federal budgets, and now it's really great to have that at the local level. Um, of course, we have concerns about increased spending. That comes with um, the territory of growth, and we have concerns about where some of the spending is, is happening, but from a process perspective, we appreciated the maturing and the commitment to transparency and more engagement. Okay, now the month of December, you really kicked that off in great style. <laughs> and uh, what will be the biggest issues in December besides the budgets? But uh, go ahead, tell us what for the county will be the biggest issue in December. Well, uh, for the county, the, one of the big things is we're uh, gonna kick off the opening of the warming shelter for the, uh, you know, the unsheltered people. 
that we're putting the finishing touches on that. The facility is ready. Catholic Charities will be running it, and they're in the process right now of training. I think we're uh, shooting for a opening date of the 15th of December. Um, that'll be a good thing. You know, we've got people, much as you may or may not uh, like it, there's people out there that are unsheltered. And when it gets really cold outside, we really don't want anybody to pass away out, out, out there. So this has been a collaborative effort with the City of Rochester and the Mayo Clinic. Uh, they've, we've teamed together and we've got, this is not a home for the homeless. I want to make that clear. This is uh, for temporary housing, for when it's cold outside. Uh, at the beginning of every day, these people are expected to get up, get out, and not, they won't be allowed to stay at the shelter during the day. They'll be able to come in at 9 or 10 at night and then they'll uh, be woken up at, I don't know, 6 or 7 in the morning, get their things, and uh, they'll have to do whatever they have to do during the day. But this is not uh, meant to be a, a fix-all or get, provide them. It's temporary shelter. That being said, we have worked with uh, our social services people. I want to put a shout out to Paul Fleischner and Dave Dunn. They've worked with uh, some of these people, a lot of people that have been in the skyways, and I think we've managed to find some permanent shelter for some of these uh, people, I think 25 to 30 of these people in the last couple of weeks. So it's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I don't know what your political views are on these things, but we really don't want to have people out there being unsheltered. I mean, I just don't think that's the thing that a democracy or the things the city of Rochester or the county of Olmsted really want to do. So it's a process. It takes time. Uh, kind of messy, but uh, we're moving forward with it. You got a bill in November from the State Department of Human Services, which was allegedly their error, for 300 and some thousand dollars, That's right? Correct. That's correct. And you said, we're not going to pay it till we get it itemized. Right, we're not going to, I mean, I, I get bills all the time in the mail. I get them for my garbage, for my fuel, for uh, a lot of things. <laughs> I'd like to see a little bit of an accounting. And especially with the problems, I mean, I'm not trying to pile on with the DHS up there. They've got problems up there too. But I'm, if I get a bill for 300 and some thousand dollars, I'm not just going to write them a check. So we're waiting to see a little bit, uh, some of the background on that and make sure that it makes sense to us. At the end of the day, somebody's going to have to pay. Um, that's, you know, clearly the taxpayers are going to pay. And I don't really agree with that. I'd like to see some uh, reform at this organization so this doesn't happen again but right now I'm not at all confident that uh, what's going on. What I'll does the state auditor say about that? Well all I know he doesn't call me Jane but all I know is what I read in the paper and uh, it I think shabby was one of the words he used and uh, uh, a lot of words that I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> Okay, so what's their deadline? By I don't know. I don't know. I've got, you know, we're busy right now with our county problems, doing our, our budgets and that type of thing. That's for our state legislators and our state senators and the governor and uh, DHS to sort out. We've got, everybody's got their own things to do. I have my opinions, but I'm just a taxpayer in that regard. Uh, I'll keep them to myself. You are the chairman of the Olmsted County Board. Well, so. like I say, I, when the bill comes to us, we're not paying that. I've directed staff, and I don't think we're not going to pay that bill until we see some accounting for that. But other than that, what reforms I'd like to see? One thing I don't want to see is that uh, DHS split up into eight different groups. It's been our six or seven or eight different groups, which there's talk about that up at the state. And I don't want to see that for the simple reason that typically when something like that happens up at the state, all that does is drain resources from the people that need it locally, and there'll be six or seven or eight different forms that we have to fill out, and we'll do a lot more paper shuffling here. And I don't want that to happen. I don't know what I want reform to look like, but I know that I don't want that to happen. Okay. Jane, I can tell you from the business community's perspective on this issue, um, and we don't envy the situation of getting a bill that is under, undefined, um, but we'd really like to see some systems thinking apply to this problem. I think what the commissioner says about, oh, well, there's going to be a potential knee-jerk reaction to let's divide this up, and so we can say, the legislature can say, we did something. We want to see them really do something that takes thinking, 
systems engineering and putting the individual at the center, not the bureaucracy at the center. So this is an opportunity for real reform, and we hope they take it. Well, and I, I'll give you an example. I mean, we've got people, people now that use services, the SNAP service or the WIC services. If they use three different services now, uh, which are funded from the state and federal, they have to fill out three different forms. I mean, we should have like one form and, you know, you qualify for this, that, or the other thing, maybe two of the things, maybe three of the things. But no, for every program that we administer for the state, they've got to fill out a different form. Well, that takes a lot of time. That's pushing paper. And I think that's a waste of time. We should have one form. I mean, if they need income verification, whatever they need, it should be one form. But I can take you right out. After this show, we can go over and I take you over to Mr. Fleischner's shop and I'll show you. Same people fill out three, four different forms to try and get benefits. I don't think that's productive. How many more people do you have to hire to do that kind of work? Well, when, when the state implemented METS uh, two years ago, we had to hire, I think it was eight additional people just to push paper. Hennepin County, I think, hired 42 people just to push paper. This is just to, to fill out the new forms that came along. That's the kind of reform I want to see. I, I want to see the people that need the money get the money. And as far as uh, shuffling paper, I'm not a big paper shuffler. How do you accomplish that? Who do you talk to? The governor? You got to work with your state legislatures. I mean, there's a, yeah, it's, it's a grind. You've got the people the, uh, you know, that run DHS or whatever. It could be the MPC, it could be anything. And, and I'm sure we do it at the county too. And then you have the elected officials. I mean, you've got the representatives, the senators, and the governor. And they all want, generally, they probably all want to see reform, but they all got their own ideas, and it just becomes a mishmash. So it's a, uh, you can't get discouraged. If you get discouraged, it just, it'll really go downhill. Okay. We're sort of seeing this from the business, the private sector perspective, as an opportunity for real collaboration and to bring in the people who do this for a living who do systems analysis and systems reform and make things run smoother. We have, you know, the Mayo Clinic, the best systems engineering organization probably in the country, if not the world, here in our backyard. Let's use some of that private sector thinking to solve this problem, to make people at the center and save taxpayer dollars. And I don't wanna, I mean, you know, you look at the license, uh, you know, getting your license tab, what a mess that was. It's easy to cast stones, but you want to try, I want to try and move forward from that. Anybody can say mm -hmm. how crummy the system is. That's easy. But how are you going to make it better? That's what I'd like to accomplish. Did I hear the looking for a new state auditor? This fellow has done a great job. Nobles? Nobles? Yep. Uh, I don't think so. I think he's in there. I think they just reappointed him, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, you okay. may have heard something I didn't hear, but I think... Republicans, Democrats, they all love him. I mean, they all know he, yep. he does what he's hired to do. <laughs> he's, he's straight, yeah. straight arrow. Um, okay, Randy, December. Well, as I already touched on, we did uh, adopt our budget, and that was a significant um, uh, thing to, we, by law, we have to accomplish that before the end of the, the month. Um, beyond that, we have a number of, of ongoing questions that we're dealing with. Uh, I'm sure people are aware of, whether it be use of the Kmart parking lot, uh, the new circulator route that we're anticipating. We continue to have discussions with our colleagues on the county board about Graham Park and Seneca as a transit village hub, uh, the North Broadway project. Uh, there are just a number of things that have been going on for a while and will continue into, into the new year. Uh, more recently, we all became aware that AMPI would be shutting down that site. Uh, so we're, we're waiting to hear what might be the outcome or repercussion of that. So many of the things that we talk about, we uh, you know, have already been in, in process for a while. And as I say, we'll continue into the new year. What's the status of the Kmart law? So the, the point we're at right now, there will be a meeting coming up uh, late this week, in fact, where the major stakeholders will be getting together, a couple of our elected uh, city council members, uh, Mayo Clinic representatives, uh, the property owner representatives. Uh, part of the dilemma is that we recently adopted a new zoning for that area, uh, a tran 
transit overlay or uh, district or TOD we call it and that has certain criteria and so it, as we apply the criteria to that parcel of land uh, we have to see if that will be acceptable uh, in terms of the uh, the usage for that that property uh, and, and, and part of the the dilemma here too is it it's only intended to be a quote temporary use temporary meaning five to ten years the idea being that once the transit village on the Seneca property is developed then the need for this uh, uh, use presumably goes away and I think we all agree that that use of a, a surface parking lot is not the highest and best use for that Kmart property so we're we're in this uh, this conundrum of you know how best do we use it now uh, but also have the assurances that it will truly go away at some future point uh, so there are some details we have some layouts for the property uh, that include or not include demolition of that building uh, and, and I think part of the 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 thing that we struggle with is that while some people might not like it to be a parking used for parking um, the alternative is not that great either if we don't use it for parking well now it becomes pres uh, presumably an eyesore for the neighborhood you, you'd have an asphalt lot with weeds uh, a building that just sits vacant and uh, begins to look run down uh, until the developer at some point in the future decides what to do with it so that's not necessarily the best uh, use or, or outcome either uh, so I think mostly what the, the concerns are now is not necessarily use as a temporary parking lot, but what's the impact of the traffic and what will be the traffic patterns. Uh, there are some that are fearful that traffic, instead of going to the west and, and, and connecting with Broadway, uh, that they might go east and actually into the residential neighborhood over to 8th Avenue southeast, then south and pick up the... Uh, Highway 14 by the Kentucky Fried Chicken outlet. So you could potentially have people, people will find a way. They will find a way to make it convenient. And that's what we're, we're talking about now and what's the best way to mitigate that. What's going to be the impact on the adjoining residential neighborhoods? Does Ampy's leaving that major building change anything? Not for this discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm told that there are already some processes in place where they're starting to do evaluation of that property. Uh, there could even be a prospective buyer out there uh, based on that, that appraisal. Um, and, and that is literally all we know at this point. Those are all private transactions. We wouldn't necessarily be privy to that anyway. So it would be you know, far too premature to, to speculate what might happen there. Uh, they don't officially close, I believe, until the end of this year. So, you know, we've got another 30 days. How about Elton Hills? That has come up most recently. It has, and we do have a neighborhood meeting coming up next week uh, where staff will be presenting the um, traffic study and the traffic analysis they did and some of their ideas. You are correct that the neighborhood has been very vocal in, in uh, expressing their wishes. They uh, clearly do not want to see a uh, road diet of going from four lanes to, to one lane in either direction and a turn lane. Rather, they, they you know, the, the, we're talking about the people that use this road daily. Um, they are actually proposing a few strategic changes. For example, a, a couple of well-placed stoplights to help control the traffic. One of the concerns I have is that the uh, crash history for that roadway is is not suggestive of a change. Uh, the crash history is not that is not bad, and you have to keep in mind that that Elton Hills was originally designed as a major east-west thoroughfare. Uh, you have to go north to 37th Street or south to Civic Center Drive before you find another east-west corridor, and so that will be important. You know, do we if, if it was designed properly for its uh, intended and current use, I think we have to be a little careful what, what problem are we trying to solve. So I'll be looking forward to, I'll be attending that meeting, uh, I, I believe it's Monday evening, uh, at, at, at uh, one of the schools, I'd, I'd have to look it up, one of the elementary schools there on, on Elton Hills Elton Drive. Hills. 
and uh, and looking forward to hearing the the uh, staff information and then we'll be discussing all of that at an upcoming afternoon session at uh, city of the council and the circulator is still alive and threatening if you will um, is that in the budget for next year um, that one there's some different funding sources for that we can apply for some grants from the federal government uh, as well as some local funding so we're just now starting to first we needed to approve it uh, at the council level which we did the route so the mode and, and the route so we talk about buses uh, or rapid transit I should say uh, and then the route on Broadway versus some of the other uh, proposed routes. So that will be important. Uh, we made that decision. Now we can start to actually uh, begin the process of applying for grants and you know starting to pull together funding. The transit village that I mentioned earlier, we don't expect to see that until pro for probably five years, give or take. You know, and, and it'll be phased anyway. Uh, so it's going to take some time for that to happen, and, and so these all uh, run together. The transit village, the circulator route, uh, additional buses, and, and so forth. Uh, so that, again, that's, these things are all interwoven. That's why we need some sort of temporary solution, uh, which is why we talk about the Kmart lot. Okay. Can I just make one point, Jane, about the transportation? Sure. It's um, from the business community's perspective, I, all of what's the thinking and the visioning is excellent um, for transportation for a future of fewer cars in downtown. But <coughs> there's a little bit of cart before the horse going on here and increasing parking fees to the tune of 34% in one year is a little problematic and then looking at 2023 having annual a monthly fee of $225 is going to be incredibly um, harmful to employers to have their employees come but more importantly for residents to come downtown and shop so we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here in terms of trying to change behavior of driving without having the new assets which are going to be great so we're we're asking the council to really think more about phasing this a little bit more uh, coherently for the sake of our downtown business community and and I would agree with that the the pace is the hard part we, yes. we know what the end goal is or what right. we would like the end goal to be uh, but the pace and how quickly uh, that that's uh, a little bit of guesswork at times for example we approved a housing project um, that will have no parking mm -hmm. for residents and it's it's a, a property that immediately adjoins st. Mary's Hospital the vision or the philosophy is people will occupy this space that don't need a car or don't have a, an auto or they're willing to park it you know uh, some ways away because they will be walking to work at one of the adjoining businesses now that's the vision it's a great philosophical point but you know are we getting the cart before the horse again what happens if if those individuals in fact need autos and now there's no parking provided and that if if you've driven in the st mary's area <clears throat> that's a very congested space during the work day so uh, we can we can plan for it, but it will will people really? Okay, are you getting along? are you getting any pushback from the park on the alternate sides of the road on a number of places around the city, including Fourth Street Southwest? We are, you know, we're, we're getting some feedback already. Uh, I think the the proof will really be this winter season. Mm -hmm. Um, in the summertime, when you can see all the painted stripes and, and so forth, e even though it's taking some education uh, uh, for people to get used to, especially if you're parallel parking in that area, it just feels very awkward to have this, this lane both to your left and your right. Um, so I think the proof will be now in the winter when many of those lines are obliterated, um, you know, and whether we can effectively keep them plowed and, and used as as intended so I think the jury is still out on that one especially near st. Mary's where there's so few parking places and uh, it's it's really difficult mm -hmm. to be able to have all these employees have a place to park well and we know that's an ongoing issue uh, there's just not enough parking downtown yeah, but uh, this is this is 
not quite downtown, but it, oh it's, goodness, it's on the on the periphery, and uh, it's it's uh, we know there's not enough parking, and realistically, we can't create enough parking even if we wanted to. The size of the parking structures and the amount of land footprint okay. it would take. We got to go on because we're down to our last five minutes, and right. the biggest issue that arose last night at the council meeting is the salaries of our elected officials. Uh -huh. And why don't you comment on that? Well, as I've commented to some others, uh, clearly some people will support the decision we make. People, some people will be opposed. And, and I, I highly doubt that I would be able to change their opinion one way or the other. Um, people have the premise that it's a public servant role and you're giving back to the community uh, and, th and that should be a driver. Uh, but uh, currently, if you depend on, and it's really not a discussion of full-time, part-time, it's you do the work that you need to do to serve your community. But if you use, um, you know, the full-time, part-time uh, parameter, uh, I, for example, if you consider me full-time, and this is very much a full-time job, uh, I make $13 an hour. Um, is that a fair value? And when we make the decisions we make, we administer a $383 million budget, we make a lot of decisions that could affect the community for decades to come. Um, I'm not saying that that we should necessarily, I don't know what that number should exactly be. The, the number we set is based on area median income, so it will fluctuate. Um, and, and we made a decision, these are very hard decisions. One, one option I brought forward uh, about three years ago was to form a citizen committee to do a market study I was gonna ask and, if you set, had such a and set compensation or at least recommend compensation. That was voted on by the council, but it was vetoed and there, was not, there were not enough votes to override that veto. Uh, the thinking at the time was the council shouldn't, should step up to that. If you're gonna set your compensation, set it. Uh, and don't have a committee do it. Um, so that idea didn't, didn't gain traction. Okay, now are you getting any pushback? Oh, absolutely. But we get that you know, on any topic, whether it be Kmart or uh, North Broadway uh, project, we, we always get some, some feedback, um, both, both positive and negative. And so in certain respects, this is no different uh, in, in that regard. I, I, I appreciate it, actually, because if people are willing to approach me with a, a good, compelling argument, um, I, I always listen. Um, now, clearly, you, you, we have some folks that you know are, are not necessarily; they're a bit more irrational about it. But but if you if if we can agree to disagree, or we can have that intelligent conversation, uh, and I'm always open to listening. Okay, Jim, you're dying to say something, but would you like to comment? Uh, no, I'm just kind of taking it all in here. I, you know, this is a great discussion. I'm not dying to say anything other than have a great holiday season. <laughs> <laughs> Drive <laughs> safe, too. Don't be drinking and driving. you got enough problems out there at the slippery roads. It got a lot. No road construction now, but with all this nasty weather, make sure you take it easy out there. Leave five minutes earlier. Great okay. message. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Um, I would just like to close with a, the request for everyone to shop local first, recognizing that 30% of the revenue of the retailers, and so our small business retailers and many service providers comes during this last quarter, this holiday season. So before you get in your car to go to the cities or get online, think, is that product available here? Have I checked locally? And do your best to shop local first. It helps your friends, it helps your neighbors, it helps our local economy. And Randy, what's the next step for the salary issue? Uh, well, we essentially adopted it. So we had, had the first reading, the process we go through, we have a first reading and a second reading. Uh, we'll do the second reading at our first meeting in January. And then as soon as it's published, it becomes effective. That, this works for any ordinance that we adopt. Uh, this one being no different. So we began the process last evening unless somebody were to object or bring the vote back or something of that nature, uh, we'll have the second reading in January and then it will take effect shortly after that. Was a COLA included in, in it or? No, we actually wanted to tie it to area median income okay. because we have had times when area median income goes down 
as the economy fluctuates up and down, so will our compensation now. Okay. Uh, I'm sure we haven't heard the last of this issue, but uh, good luck. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to close, and we want to thank you, our viewers, for your interest all year. And uh, our next program will be the first Tuesday in January, and uh, we will bring you up to date on a bunch of other issues at that time. But it's been a very interesting session, and I thank you all three for being here. Thank you, Jane. Jim Beer, Randy Saver, and Kathleen Harrington. Thank you. And uh, happy holiday season to all of you.